Hello, everyone, and thanks for listening today. This is the RX Daily Dose. Today's episode is being recorded on Friday, January 17th, and I'm your host, Ian Parnagoni. We update this podcast every week for healthcare providers, medical professionals, and anyone who has an interest in drug updates. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe on all of your favorite podcast platforms and social media, including iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, and Instagram. All links can be found in the show notes below. We only have a few updates this week. The first, on January 9th, the FDA approved avapritinib, going by brand name Avakit, for the treatment of adults with unresectable gastrointestinal stromal tumor. That's a type of tumor that occurs in the gastrointestinal tract, most commonly in the stomach or small intestines. Also, patients need to have a platelet-derived growth factor receptor alpha exon 18 mutation. This approval includes GIST that harbors a PDG-FRA-D842V mutation, which is the most common exon 18 mutation. Avakit is a kinase inhibitor, meaning it blocks a type of enzyme called a kinase and helps keep the cancer cells from growing. Gastrointestinal stromal tumors, also known as GIST for short, arise from a specialized nerve cells found in the walls of the gastrointestinal tract. One or more mutations in the DNA of one of these cells may lead to the development of GIST. These cells aid in the movement of food through the intestines and control various digestive processes. More than half of GISTs start in the stomach. Most of the others start in the small intestines, but GIST can start anywhere along the GI tract. The activating mutations in PDG-FRA have been linked to the development of GIS, and up to approximately 6-10% of GIS cases involve mutations of this gene. The FDA-approved AVAKIT, based on the results of a clinical trial involving 43 patients with GIS, harboring a PDG-FRA exon 18 mutation, including 38 patients with PDG-FRA-D842V mutations. Patients received Avakit 300 mg or 400 mg orally once daily until disease progression or they experience unacceptable toxicity. The recommended dose was determined to be 300 mg once daily. The trial measured how many patients experience complete or partial shrinkage of their tumors during treatment. For patients harboring a PDG-FRA exon 18 mutation, the overall response rate was 84%, with 7% having a complete response and 77% having a partial response. For the subgroup of patients with PDG-FRA D842V mutations, the overall response rate was 89%, with 8% having a complete response and 82% having a partial response. 61% of the responding patients with exon 18 mutations had a response lasting longer than 6 months. Common side effects for patients taking Avakit were edemas, nausea, vomiting, decreased appetite, diarrhea, abdominal pain, constipation, rash, and dizziness. Avakit can cause intracranial hemorrhage, in which case the dose should be reduced or the drug should be discontinued. Avakit can also cause central nervous system effects, including cognitive impairment, dizziness, sleep disorders, mood disorders, speech disorders, and hallucinations. If this happens, depending on the severity, Avakit should be withheld and then resumed at the same or reduced dose upon improvement or permanently discontinued. And although Avakit is the first targeted therapy in GIST for this gene mutation, it will compete with Gleevec, Sutent, and Stavarga, who all have approvals in GIST. Healthcare professionals should advise pregnant women that Avakit may cause harm to the developing fetus or newborn baby 
Additionally, the FDA advises healthcare professionals to tell females of reproductive potential and males with female partners to use effective contraception during treatment with Avocet and for six weeks after the final dose. The FDA granted this application breakthrough therapy designation, which expedites the development and review of drugs that are intended to treat a serious condition when preliminary clinical evidence indicates that the drug may demonstrate substantial improvement over available therapies. Avakit was also granted fast-track designation, which expedites the review of drugs to treat serious conditions and fill an unmet medical need. Avakit received orphan drug designation, which provides incentives to assist and encourage the development of drugs of rare diseases. Also this week, the FDA put out a statement on January 14th regarding the weight loss medication Lorcaserin, going by brand name Belvique. In the statement, the FDA is alerting the public that results from a clinical trial assessing safety of the drug show a possible increased risk of cancer. They state the cause of the cancer is uncertain, and they cannot conclude that Belvique contributes to the cancer risk. However, they wanted to make the public aware of the potential risk. The trial being referenced involved about 12,000 participants over five years and found, and I quote, more patients taking Belvique were diagnosed with cancer compared to patients taking placebo. The FDA originally approved Belvique back in 2012, and after a 2018 study yielded promising results, it was touted as the holy grail in the fight against obesity. The appetite suppressant works by stimulating brain chemicals that make its users feel more full. But the headlines really overhype the drug, according to the UK's National Health Service fast-checking service, which noted that the study found a small amount of weight loss over a period of 40 months. Issei, which is the manufacturer, put out a statement also and is recommending patients speak directly with their healthcare professional in order to make the best decision about their medical treatment. As indicated in the FDA's communication at this time, the FDA and Issei cannot conclude that Belvique increases the risk of cancer. Also this week, the FDA has approved a new indication for mycofungin injectable, going by brand name Mycamine, in support of the treatment of candidemia, acute disseminated candidiasis, candida peritonitis, and abscesses without meningoencephalitis and or ocular dissemination in pediatric patients younger than four months of age. With the approval, mycamine is the first antifungal drug approved in the United States specifically for the treatment of invasive candidiasis in this patient population. Candidiasis in newborns is associated with 20% mortality and significant morbidity and mortality in infants. Mycamine was approved for adults for candida infections in 2005 and in 2013 for pediatric patients age 4 months and older. The safety of mycamine was assessed in 168 pediatric patients younger than 4 months of age who received varying doses of mycamine in 9 clinical trials. The approved dose of mycamine in neonates and young infants less than 4 months is 4 mg per kilogram once daily. And in the news this week, the FDA finalized guidance on enforcement on unauthorized flavored cartridge-based e-cigarettes. The ban, which goes into effect next month, bans the sale of fruity flavors in cartridge-based e-cigarettes, but the restriction won't apply to tank vaping systems commonly found at vape shops. Under this policy, the companies that do not cease manufacture, distribution, and sale of unauthorized flavored cartridge-based e-cigarettes, other than tobacco or menthol, within 30 days are at risk for FDA enforcement actions. E-cigarette makers can apply to the FDA for permission to bring flavored products back on the market, but to do so, they must demonstrate that the products provide a net benefit to public health. Also starting this year, for those of you that don't know, the age to purchase tobacco has increased from 18 to 21 at the federal level. And also this week, California could become the first state to make its own prescription drugs under a proposal announced last week by Governor Gavin Newsom, 
who says it would, quote, take the power out of the hands of greedy manufacturers. The Democratic governor wants the nation's most populous state to contract with generic drug companies to make medications on its behalf so it could sell them to its nearly 40 million residents. The goal of the program, according to the governor, is to lower prices by increasing competition in the generic drug market. His proposal also would create a single market for drug pricing in California, with companies having to bid to sell their medicine at a uniform price. One expert said that piece would have the bigger impact. Most countries control or negotiate the price of drugs, and in our case, if it's one state that could do it, it's probably California. It's hard for a drug company to walk away from California as a whole. Lawmakers would have to approve the proposal before they could become law. What I found most concerning about the proposal and commentary from California lawmakers was a gap in the understanding on generic drug economics. One lawmaker referenced this as Costco brand Kirkland. It's like saying you want to go to the great value brand for your products and open up your own store to buy them. The state might be surprised at how much it ends up charging for its own generic products because of factors beyond its control, including raw material shortages and disruptions in the supply chain. It's also important to note that generic drugs make up about 80% of the market and typically only account for 15-20% to of total drug cost. This is because of the competition available in the generic marketplace. This drug plan from California is part of Newsom's budget proposal, which he must present to lawmakers by January 17th. The state could have as much as a $7 billion surplus this year, according to the nonpartisan legislative analyst's office. California law currently requires companies to report any price increases to the state. Generic drugs saw a three-year median increase of 37.6%, according to a report from the Office of Statewide Health Planning and Development. That analysis was based on the list prices of the drugs and did not include discounts or rebates. But the report doesn't include generic drugs that decreased in price because companies are not required to report that. Nationally, however, generic drug prices have been decreasing overall. And that's all I have for this week. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. I'll include all links and resources in the show notes below, so please go back and check those out too. Please connect with me on any of your social media platforms and give me feedback on what you listened to today. I'd love to know what you thought about the episode. And as always, feel free to like, share, and subscribe wherever you listen to your podcasts. And thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. by Joseph McDade.